It's been about six months since I started driving for Uber. Until then, I had a high-pressure career in law. Therefore, the money's not quite what I'm used to. That is not why I do it, though. The flexibility is the real reason that I made the change. In my previous career, the concept of work-life balance was almost laughable. 12-hour days, work calls in the middle of the night. It was rough. I was working the night shift in the downtown core, driving drunk people home from the clubs mostly. I would get the occasional unruly passenger, but most nights were fairly uneventful. Last night, however, was anything but. It was around 2 a.m. and I was getting ready to call it a night when I received a ride request. It was about 20 minutes away, but it was in the direction of my apartment, so I reluctantly accepted. My eyelids had become heavy as I made my way past the empty streets, which were full of late-night partygoers not more than an hour before. The full moon lit the barren city enough that the bright streetlights were hardly needed. As I approached the pickup destination, I noticed a tall man in his 30s staring at his phone. He had short black hair and glasses. A look of frustration was plastered on his face like he was struggling to enter his password correctly. He had the new iPhone 10 with a bright red case. I noticed because I was thinking of upgrading to the same. He swayed like a tree in a windstorm, showing all the signs of someone who has had too much to drink. He must have had a good night, I said to myself. I was no stranger to inebriated passengers after all. He lowered his phone as I stopped my car in front of him. You must be Jake, I said. That's what the ladies call me, he laughed loudly. I offered a forced smirk out of pity for what I assumed was supposed to be a joke. He jumped into the back seat and we took off. Although I couldn't smell any alcohol on him, he continued to show signs of drunkenness. I'm not a drinker, but I don't judge especially because it is better that they ride with me rather than getting behind the wheel themselves. He had scheduled one stopover to make on the way. We just need to pick something up from my brother's house, he said. His speech was surprisingly clear for someone who I assumed had been drinking. Come to think of it, something about his demeanor was off, like his gestures were exaggerated and forced. I didn't think much of it, it had been a long night, and I didn't completely trust my own judgment. No problem, I replied. I stopped the car in front of what I assumed was his brother's house, which was actually an apartment building in a rough neighborhood. Do you need help? I asked. No, just pop the trunk. I did what he said, starting to feel creeped out. I watched through the rearview mirror as Jake and another man loaded a large black duffel bag into my trunk. As I peered through the mirror, it became clear from his movements and the muffled conversation that Jake was not drunk at all. But why pretend? He must have been putting on a show for me. Maybe it was a sick joke. Before I had the chance to react, Jake hopped into the back seat and the other man disappeared. As we continued our ride, Jake went quiet. His bloodshot eyes stared at me through the mirror with a fiery intensity. Perhaps he could sense my fear and thought I was onto him for whatever nefarious deeds he was up to. He wasn't even acting drunk anymore. I was eager to get this ride over with, but I didn't want to cancel it and risk upsetting him. I decided it was best to drop him off and hope that we never cross paths again. I felt a tremendous weight lift from my shoulders when I pulled up to his final destination. Well, this is it, I said with a forced pleasantness. He was staring at his phone again like he was struggling to unlock it. Why was he having so much trouble with his phone, I wondered, since I knew he wasn't even drunk. To my relief, Jake got out of my car and headed to the trunk which I had popped open for him. He slammed it shut and disappeared into the night without saying a word. What a relief, I gasped. It seemed that whatever he was up to, it didn't have anything to do with me. I was still curious about what was in the duffel bag, but I figured I would never find out. 
I pulled into my driveway after one of the strangest nights of my life and sighed with relief. I always look through my car at the end of the night to check if my passengers left anything behind. There usually isn't much to find. People are pretty careful with their things for the most part. On my first scan, I didn't find anything. However, when I looked under the back seat, I noticed a bright red iPhone 10. There was no doubt that it was Jake's. Normally I would try to return it to its owner, but I was so creeped out by Jake that I was ready to throw it in the trash. I turned it on to see a selfie as the background image, but it wasn't Jake. It looked like a young man in his 20s with short red hair and freckles. This wasn't Jake's phone at all. That's why he was struggling to use it. My stomach dropped when I realized something else. I didn't actually see Jake remove the bag from my trunk. Struggling to hold back tears, I walked around to the back of the car. I opened the trunk, and to my horror, the large duffel bag was still there. My hand slowly inched towards the zipper on the bag. I pulled it down, and what I saw will haunt my dreams forever. There was a dead body in the bag. To make matters worse, he was the young man with short hair and freckles. The phone belonged to him. Uber's records will show that I was the last one to see this man alive, and there's no doubt that Jake was smart enough to wipe his fingerprints off before he left. I can't go to the police now, so I only have one choice. Now I just need to find a shovel. I was a 22-year-old student and I was delivering for Uber Eats part-time. I didn't really need the job, but my parents had very traditional values and they brought me up to value hard work. So I guess you could say that I was trying to make them proud. Since I was in school, my shifts were almost always in the evenings. That's when most of the orders come in anyway. I took a large order from a sushi place that was for a house on a side of town that I didn't know well. I thought it was the rich part of town, but as I got closer, it began to feel more like the middle of nowhere. Old cornfields and abandoned farmhouses sparsely populated the roadside. It was just past 11pm and there were no streetlights. I felt vulnerable, as if my headlights were the only thing separating me from inescapable darkness. As I neared my destination, I was relieved to see a bright light coming from the front window on the bottom floor of the house. Like other houses in the area, it was an old farmhouse. The nearest neighbor was at least a mile in either direction. Not that it would matter, because I'm almost certain that every other house was uninhabited. I pulled up to the front of the house and noticed the shadows of many people behind the drapes of the front window. It looked like they were having a party. As I made my way up the walkway to the front door, I noticed something suspicious. There were no cars other than mine. This area was definitely not on any public transit route. It is possible that they took a taxi or used Uber, so I was not too alarmed. It did seem weird though. I knocked on the door and waited. After less than a minute, the door opened and I was greeted by an older woman in an extravagant red gown. She was done up with makeup and red lipstick. I could hear music coming from the other room where the party seemed to be. Oh, thank you, dear. My guests will be so happy that the food is here. She said with the warm tone of a grandmother. No problem, have a good night. I replied with a typical canned pleasantry. I was about to turn around and head back to my car when she interrupted me. Oh dear, you're leaving without your tip? She said. Whatever you left on the app should be fine, I replied. I looked at my phone and noticed that she had already left a generous tip. I'm a traditional lady and I prefer to give it to you in person. I was torn. The isolation of the area gave me the creeps. However, I was comforted by the fact that the house seemed to be full of other people. That and her grandmotherly demeanor made me feel at ease. I didn't want to be rude, so I obliged. Okay, thank you. That is very generous. I replied graciously. 
Excellent. Come in and make yourself comfortable. I need to find my purse. This dress doesn't have any pockets. I stepped inside and waited in the foyer as the woman disappeared down the hall. The party was going on in the next room and there was a closed door between us. I could hear the woman rummaging around and it sounded like she was in the basement. That seemed like a strange place for her to keep her purse. I felt a little uneasy but I was comforted by the fact that there was a room full of people right next door. They were strangely quiet though. I could hear music but no talking. I wondered what was going on in there. Just then, the woman shouted. Young man, can you come down here? I need your help with something. Her warm tone changed to a creepy cackle. My mood instantly changed. I should have just left, but my curiosity wouldn't allow it. I inched closer to the door dividing the foyer from the party. I cracked the door open and peeked inside. There were seven to ten mannequins arranged throughout the room. I was all alone. Fear rushed through my body and I heard a door slam. The old woman stood at the end of the hall with the creepiest smile I have ever seen. Would you care to join us? She cackled. I couldn't squeeze out a single word. I just ran to my car. I don't know if she chased me. I didn't have time to check. I've moved on from this job since then. After graduation, I landed an internship at a large tech company. There's no way of knowing what her plans were for me. I'm thankful every day that I never found out.